Grammar Girl here, I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a quick and dirty tip about the difference between bi-weekly and semi-weekly, and I respond to a listener question about the way I pronounce the word forward. I have some friends who work in New York, and a couple of years ago, they received a notice that said they were going to be paid bi-weekly from now on. The problem was that nobody could tell what bi-weekly meant, and their human resources department reported being inundated with calls from confused employees. Semi means half. You can try to remember that by remembering that semi-sweet chocolate is only half sweet, and semi-annual sales happen twice a year. Bi can mean both two and twice. A bicycle has two tires, and the bicentennial happens after 200 years, but a biannual event happens twice a year. A listener named Eric pointed out that these terms are relatively set in the mortgage industry. A bi-monthly payment is paid two times a month, but a bi-weekly payment is not two times a week, as you might presume if you were trying to adhere to just one meaning for the prefix bi. No, a bi-weekly payment in the mortgage industry apparently happens every two weeks. The Merriam-Webster website explains that the, quote, ambiguity has been in existence for nearly a century and a half, unquote. How frustrating. At first glance, then, knowing the meaning of the prefixes doesn't help. Does a bi-weekly paycheck come every two weeks or twice a month? Or twice a week, as a hopeful person may wonder. My friends guessed that it meant they got a paycheck every two weeks, and they were right. As in the mortgage industry, the definition of bi-weekly is typically every two weeks. If they were going to get a check twice a month, HR probably would have said the payments would be bi-monthly. But it's confusing. The earliest example I can find in the Oxford English Dictionary has bi-weekly meaning twice a week, as our very hopeful employee may think. And as Garner's Modern English Usage notes, biannual and semiannual both correctly mean occurring twice a year. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English Usage notes that the words can take on industry-specific meanings, too. They said that in publishing, bimonthly usually means every two months. But in education, bimonthly usually means twice a month. The most important thing to notice here is that many people are confused about the meaning of words such as bi-weekly and bi-monthly. Most style guides recommend avoiding these words. Instead, just use the phrases twice a week or every other week. It's more clear. So that's your quick and dirty tip. It's much more important to be clear than to use the proper word if the proper word is just going to confuse people. Before we move forward with Forward, today we're sponsored by Babbel, the language learning app that will get you speaking a new language quickly and with confidence. She is from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Babbel is designed to get you speaking your new language within weeks, and it's been proven effective across multiple studies. Babbel's quick, engaging lessons are lovingly created by more than 100 language experts. They're real people, not a translation machine. And Babbel is available as an app or online, and your progress will be synced across all devices. Be bold this summer and learn a new language with Babbel like I am. Every morning, I prop up my iPad and go through a Babbel Spanish lesson while I'm eating my breakfast, and I love it. It's fun. All it takes is a few steps to speak a new language with confidence. Go to babbel.com or download the app. Select the language of your choice and try it free. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com. Babbel, speak a new language with confidence. A listener named Paul posted this kindly worded comment on Facebook. He wrote, quote, Mignon, I love your podcast. I've listened to every single episode. I love your sense of humor, and I love your pleasant speaking voice, except for one thing. Would you please, please, pretty please with sugar on top, stop mispronouncing the word forward. You almost always pronounce it forward instead of the correct forward. You've done it for years and years. If this is some regional variation of the word, then I apologize, but I have never heard anyone else pronounce it forward in my life, unquote. 
Thank you, Paul. You're right. When I think about it, I do pronounce the word forward, and I never realized I was doing it. It's just how I say the word. I guess my pronunciation is more like the British pronunciation because people with a British accent tend to drop their R's. I'll never forget sitting in an intro to biology class with a professor who had a strong British accent, and she told us we needed to mark our tubes for an experiment. And I thought she said we had to mock our tubes, like make fun of them. And I was super confused, and I wasn't even close to the only one who'd thought she said that. In fact, so many people were looking at each other and asking, we're supposed to mock our tubes? That she got really annoyed and clarified in an exaggerated American accent. You need to mark your tubes. Anyway, getting back to forward, there's no reason I would tend toward a British pronunciation. So what's going on? It turns out that even though you may not have heard anyone else pronounce it that way, it's not a rare pronunciation in the United States. The online Merriam-Webster dictionary includes it as an alternate pronunciation, although the other dictionaries I checked don't. It turns out that it's actually a well-known linguistic phenomenon called dissimilation. In dialects like American English that are rhotic, meaning we pronounce our R's, people still tend to drop an R if it's in the middle of a word and comes before another syllable that has an R. That's why you hear surprise instead of surprise, adversary instead of adversary, caterpillar instead of caterpillar, and particular instead of particular. And for what it's worth, I pronounce all those words in the dissimilated way, without the first R. So it's a significant part of my speech pattern. I wondered if it's regional too, but it turns out it's not. According to a 2009 paper by Nancy Hall, the first time a linguist described people dropping the R from forward was in 1893, and that linguist cited his own southern Michigan dialect. Hall also notes that Albuquerque, a city in New Mexico, used to be spelled with an R in the second syllable, like Albuquerque. But they dropped the R from the spelling sometime in the 19th century, likely because people weren't pronouncing the R, so they decided to drop it from the spelling, too. I've also seen comments that pronouncing it forward is more common in the American South or in California, but I didn't grow up in either of those places. I grew up in Seattle, and I'm pretty sure I've been saying it this way my whole life. Ultimately, Hall's impression is these pronunciation differences are, quote, common in most and perhaps all rhotic dialects in the U.S., unquote, meaning anywhere that people normally pronounce their R's, as in mark your tubes. Fortunately, Hall says that the way I pronounce forward and other such words isn't generally stigmatized in America. So, phew, that made me feel better. I'd like to tell Paul that I'll try to pronounce it forward with the R, but I suspect that even if I tried, I'd forget in a few weeks because the way I've pronounced it all my life is so ingrained in my brain. I'm I'm sorry it bothers you, but I hope it might bother you less now that you at least know what it's called and that it's a widespread, long-standing way that some Americans pronounce these kinds of words. And thanks for the message that led me on this interesting research path. I was surprised there was so much to say about it. To finish up, I have a listener familect story about schnauzers. Hi, Grammar Girl. I have a familect story for you. When I was growing up, my family had three schnauzers, miniature schnauzers. And of course, um, we knew that a lot of words end in ER means someone who does something, like baker or butcher or candlestick maker. And so we thought schnauzing has to be something because it ends in ER. And first time we ever gave our dogs a bath, we noticed one funny behavior they did. After the bath was over, they would run around and rub their face all over the carpet in order to dry it up. And so in our family, from that point on, schnauzing meant rubbing your face against something to make it dry or, or scratch an itch. Thanks, and great show. Bye. Thank you. When I was growing up, my dear aunt had a miniature schnauzer named Shotzi. I never knew where that name came from. 
After getting your call, I did look up the origin of the word schnauzer, and perhaps not surprisingly, it comes from a German word, which means growler, and that comes from an earlier word that means snout or muzzle. So calling rubbing your face or snout or muzzle schnauzing doesn't seem that far off. I don't remember Shotzi growling a lot, but I think he's the only miniature schnauzer I've ever spent any time with. Anyway, thanks for the call. If you want to tell me a story about a word your family made up and uses, you can leave a voicemail at 833214 girl That's 833-321-44475. And I might play it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl, and my producer is Nathan Sams. Grammar Girl is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, which I founded and which also has a bunch of other podcasts. Learn new things every week by listening to Money Girl, The Savvy Psychologist, The Get It Done Guy, and a whole bunch more. Check them out wherever you listen to podcasts. That's all. Thanks for listening. 